This evening, uh, we have a very special opportunity to talk about how do citizens and community leaders communicate during a crisis. And we've assembled quite a panel to do that. Uh, for your information, we've, uh, we are, we've asked WILL Television to uh, record this because uh, we found that evenings like this are hard to replicate. And we have the opportunity on the Illinois Channel to share this kind of evening uh, many times, and we'll make that available both here on campus to the Illinois Terrorism Task Force and to the uh, Illinois Channel for uh, to be repeated. So citizens uh, who may not be able to be here tonight may be able to get the information. Um, this is being hosted uh, by the Illinois uh, University of Illinois Homeland Security Research Center, uh, the Institute of Government and Public Affairs, and the, the uh, Illinois Terrorism Task Force as something that um, is one of our principal state strategies, and that's to try and improve our capacity, ability in a crisis to communicate with citizens. And to begin, I'd like to introduce uh, Colonel Jill Morgenthaler. She's a retired Army Reserve Colonel. She was the uh, head of public affairs for the multinational command in Baghdad um, in, 19, in 2004, if I'm not mistaken, Jill. Um, served at Argonne National Laboratories as, a, as the coordinator of emergency management and has been appointed by Governor Bogoyevich as the senior Homeland Security official for the state of Illinois, other than the governor <laughs> in a crisis, but as the, chief, as the deputy chief of staff for public safety. And so under her responsibilities are emergency management, law enforcement, fire service, um, and quite frankly, uh, responding to a crisis, uh, big or small, in the state. Um, Jill, thank you for coming. But tonight you're going to hear from a panel of experts on the best ways to handle communications during a crisis. I'm more of a practitioner, not an expert. So what I want to cover this evening was kind of two things. One is I do want to talk about how you can do it the wrong way and have an everlasting disaster, which is what we saw with the prison scandal in Abu Ghraib in Iraq, which happened during my watch. And then I want to talk about what I hopefully will see as doing it the right way if we should have a catastrophe or a disaster in the state of Illinois. Now, as an Army colonel, I was in Iraq in 2004, and I became one of the spokespersons for Abu Ghraib prison scandal. And I'm going to cover with you what the military did wrong. But I would like to start off by presenting to you how I wish we had done it, kind of the if only we had done it this way scenario. So I don't, rem I don't know if on um, the younger students if you remember Abu Ghraib, how it was dealt with. Um, actually, why don't I, show of hands, how many of you remember the Abu Ghraib prison scandal? Okay, most of you, great. Now, this is how I would have liked it to have been done. Um, the role of General Ricardo Sanchez will be played tonight by Jill Morgenthaler. And this is only a simulation, especially if anybody walks in late. Ladies and gentlemen in the media, I have called this press conference to report alleged mistreatment of detainees at one of our prisons. The military has charged seven soldiers with maltreatment of detainees at Abu Ghraib prison. First, I apologize to the detainees for any mistreatments that were in violation of the Geneva Convention. I apologize to the Iraqi people. We are in Iraq to defeat terrorism and to bring freedom. And I apologize to the American people because we expect all our soldiers to act honorably. Yesterday, I learned that seven soldiers may have maltreated detainees. The alleged maltreatment appears to have occurred outside the duty hours. The alleged maltreatment was not part of the soldiers' duties. The treatment was not part of questioning the detainees. We have shocking photographs of the treatment, and they are available to you. I have seen some of the evidence. I'm horrified. I take the charges very seriously. 
As I said, we have arrested the seven soldiers. I have requested Major General Taguba to conduct a thorough investigation. And tonight with me is Brigadier General Janice Karpinski, the Commanding General of the unit overseeing the prison, Colonel Mark Warren, Legal Counsel, and Colonel X, Criminal Investigations Division. General Karpinski will answer your questions about the conduct of the prison. Colonel Warren will answer questions about the treatment of prisoners under the Geneva Convention. And Colonel X will answer questions about the criminal aspect of the accusations. Okay, if I could have done it my way, <laughs> that's how the world would have known about Abu Ghraib. It might not be perfect, but I think it would have been a lot better than how we did do it. Before I go into some of the things wrong, let me tell you what I saw in my nine months in 2004 and why Abu Ghraib in many ways broke my heart. While you watched protests about electricity on television, I actually saw businesses opening and children going to brand new schools, no longer little mud hovels. As you watched mortars exploding, I saw women choosing to take off their headscarves and taking on untraditional careers such as police and fire and military service. As you saw assassinations, I saw science, technology, medicine, and law come to Iraq, especially law. And as you saw car bombings, and boy, have you seen car bombings, I saw freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, and the right to vote just take hold. They want what we brought. And when you saw beheadings, I met Saddam Hussein. He was in shackles. He can no longer harbor terrorists. He can no longer terrorize or torture his own people. And these accomplishments and freedoms were brought about by young Americans. However, the world only knows about Abu Ghraib the world only knows about the terrible acts of seven soldiers. And the military is partially to blame for the media frenzy. We did a lot of things wrong. We did not let the, the public affairs professionals do their job. We never brought them in with the general from the prison, with the people who handled the interrogations, with the contractors who contracted out and did interrogations. We never came to one table. I had no idea we had contractors doing interrogation until the New York Times called me up and asked me about it. That's not the way to learn about something like this. And then the contractor would not return my calls. That's not the way to be honest to the world or the American people. We spent our time doing press conferences but we didn't dialogue with the public. We did not foster a public understanding so that people would understand that this was an anonymity versus an everyday occurrence. We did not have the faith so that they could understand and see that this was just a temporary negative, terrible, but negative setback that we were gonna move forward on. And instead of two-way communications with the American public, international audiences, the stakeholders, such as our soldiers and the Iraqi people, and the media, the military sat on the information until it exploded. January 26, I was brought into the Pentagon to prepare to go into Iraq. And they told me, oh, by the way, we have this ugly thing at a prison. It's going to blow up on your watch. Excuse me, bad news doesn't get better. Secrets don't go away. Why aren't we telling the public, and I'd prefer we do this before I go there. And they said, well, the general who handled the investigation wouldn't release the report. We cannot comment on it. That's a serious flaw. It's a serious flaw. The other problem is because the report was classified, couldn't comment on it, and then when uh, the media did managed to get the report and they hung it on the web, I still could not comment on it because it was not officially released. That's one way of feeling really stupid. Colonel Morgenthaler, what do you feel about this part of the report? I cannot comment on it, but it's right here. No, it's not officially released, I cannot comment on it. I was quoted a lot 
about Abu Ghraib, but my mother, the only one article she ever read was the one in New York Times where Colonel Morgenthaler would not comment. Colonel Morgenthaler would not comment. It's like, oh, thanks. The one my mother gets to read, that's what she sees her daughter doing. And when it came out, we didn't put it all out on the table. You know, these pictures kept coming out. Um, the fact that contractors were interrogating prisoners, we didn't put that out. Um, I do remember one day, uh, the media asked me, one journalist asked me, is it true Israelis are interrogating Arab prisoners? And I'm like, no, that's not true. Then afterwards I'm like, oh, I better find out. It wasn't true. However, there was an American whose last name was Israel, which did not help matters either. We were always in a reactive role, and literally six weeks of my life, 100% of the day, from 6 a.m. to about 2 a.m., I devoted to Abu Ghraib. I did not have a fact finder. I actually ended up interviewing a lot of people, the colonels, the generals, and others, so I would have the answer. They had other things to do on their plate, so we didn't often get the answers to the media in a timely manner. And I, <clears throat> I could actually watch the world wake up. 6 a.m., I briefed General Sanchez. 9 a.m., Arab media is up and the, the media in Baghdad. 11, 12, Europe is starting to make, wake up. The calls are coming in from England and Spain and Germany and other places. Then I, I got a breather usually catch lunch and work out a little bit, and then the East Coast woke up. Baltimore, New York, Washington, and then I got the Chicago Tribune, Sun-Times, then I got Denver, and around 1 a.m. I got San Diego and L.A. They don't care if they're calling me in my room waking me up. They've got their story to do. It literally did. It took six weeks, and, and in some ways the story is still going on. The other thing we didn't do well, I shouldn't say this. We did one thing right. General Sanchez apologized. Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld apologized. President Bush apologized. General Karpinski never apologized. She's still pointing fingers and blaming others. It was on her watch. She is a general officer. She has colonels like me who get things done. She owes Americans still an apology to this day. We gave America a black eye. We discredited the fine work of our 130,000 soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen who are over there doing great things. We lost international support, but worst of all, we did let down the American people by the way we handled this. So, I like to think I learned from mistakes. So as Governor Blagojevich is Deputy Chief of Staff for Public Safety, besides learning from these gentlemen tonight, the things I plan on doing during a catastrophe or crisis is, first of all, bring in the public affairs professionals, but also bring in the experts. Dedicate someone to finding the facts. Lay it out. Here's the dirty laundry, folks. And we promise to fix it, but put it out there. Coordinate with other interested parties. You know, I told you how we weren't able to dialogue with the contractors. I work very closely with the city of Chicago. That's one of the things the governor told me, make sure we do, and we do. If something should happen in Chicago, I'm going to be speaking to them and vice versa. Inform the stakeholders if it happens in this area. I want to be speaking to you all before I'm speaking to the media. Now, often the media will be the way to reach you. Then, of course, have fact sheets, have people who are responsible who um, are rehearsed, who are trained, who are able to speak, and get that information out timely. And when we talk about an emergency, a pandemic flu or a dirty bomb, there's a lot of instructions we have to give out to the public. So we've got to use our communication assets. And in the state of Illinois, we actually have communication assets all across the state. We can be at any situation within one to two hours. We now have a database of 911 operators, which means if something goes down in a little area and they don't have the support, we can get the 911 operators out there. We can get the information out to the public, what to do, where to go. We have the Amber Alert boards on the highway. 
I was so grateful to see Walgreens was using their boards for the Kentucky incident the other day. I'm trying to find out who to thank on that. We have the Illinois Broadcast Association, which will give us two minutes to get our message out, and you can say a lot in two minutes. We'll use our website, and one project I'm hoping to get done, I'm looking for support, is to have in every phone book, when you open it up, two pages to tell you what to do if it's a flood, a tornado, an earthquake, mass shelter in place, etc., so that you have that in front of you too. Because for me to keep people alive, we have got to communicate thoroughly and accurately. In conclusion, I want to work with the media. I have to make sure I build a relationship of trust with them. I also have to walk the fine line between operation security and the need to know. Uh, the potential bombers out of Miami, the potential bombers out of London, some information I knew, could not share with. So I have that fine line. I need that element of trust because often the media is the first to know, such as that contractor doing interrogations. And then I need to have that relationship of trust because if there are lies or misinformation, I need to have a means of countering it. The government and the media do not have to have a hate-hate relationship. We have a story to tell. Our critics won't be silent. Illinoisans want to hear from the practitioners as well as the media and the experts. The state has an obligation to be accountable. And through the public forums, through the media, the state is able to gain public support for what we do. So at this point, I'm going to turn over back to Dick, and I look forward to answering questions from you all later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, I, I think you can tell from that that uh, those of us, uh, we we're privileged, we have the state fire marshal here uh, in the office. Dave, thank you for coming. Uh, we've got many officials throughout the state at every level who, who take seriously not just their duties, but how to connect with citizens. Our challenge is how do we do that? And that's why we're here tonight. Um, our next speaker will be uh, Dean and Professor uh, Ron Yates. Uh, I accuse Ron of every time I've been around the world as a Marine someplace, he was there making it bad for me. Um, but it seems as if uh, he's been in most of the crisis spots uh, over the last uh, 20 plus years as the international correspondent for Chicago Tribune. Uh, Latin America, Asia, uh, Japan, he lived and worked uh, in those countries, uh, not just dealing with Americans there, but dealing with all of the issues there and understanding the cultures. He's been in places uh, uh, like the fall of Saigon and Tiananmen Square, um, political upheavals in countries and wars and revolutions. Um, as a correspondent, he worked on and was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize on a number of occasions. And um, it, I don't know if you saw it in the uh, local paper, but uh, wrote an extraordinary, uh, did an extraordinary effort to really understand uh, Tokyo Rose. The Tokyo Express, and, and went to understand the human character behind it, and is currently working on a book called The Last Rickshaw Home, A Foreign Correspondent's Journey Throughout Asia. I've asked Ron to talk um, at, from a journalist's perspective, as the conduit that you listen to as public officials try to talk. How does the correspondent, the media, go about doing its business in a crisis? Ron? <clears throat> Thanks, Dick. Thanks Thank you very much, Dick. Um, <clears throat> well, I think uh, what Jill just talked about, uh, she hit on a very few, uh, several very interesting points about uh, how you deal with the media. And obviously, had uh, the media been dealt with in the way that she said tonight, the way she suggested, uh, this would have been an entirely different result, I think. This whole story would have been handled differently. But in the 25 years that I spent as a foreign and national correspondent for the Chicago Tribune, before coming to the University of, University of Illinois, 
I, uh, I covered, did cover my share, as, as Dick pointed out, of tragedy and the disaster, war, revolution, terrorist attacks, uh, upheaval, other forms of turmoil. In fact, I covered so much of these kinds of stories that I, I became known at the Tribune as Mr. Mayhem. Uh, if there was a war somewhere, I, I went. And uh, <clears throat> the same thing for hurricanes, typhoons, tornadoes, earthquakes, whatever, uh, volcanoes. Uh, you know, where's Yates? That would be the first words out of an editor's mouth if a war or revolution broke out someplace. And usually I was already there covering a, a war or a disaster someplace in the neighborhood anyway. So what I'd like to do is talk to, to a little bit this evening about <coughs> the realm of crisis communication from the perspective of the news media and something I can talk about from firsthand experience. And what I'd like to do is give you some idea about the care and feeding of the media during a crisis disaster or disaster. And let me begin by saying that I think American newsrooms do a generally a good job of covering disaster and tragedy. I mean, I think they've been doing it long enough that they've, they've figured it out, they know how to do it. They give essentially voice to the suffering and they show the audience something most people couldn't comprehend without stories or images. That's a very important and compelling reason for why journalists go to these places and cover these kinds of stories. Uh, it's a very Im important function of the media and it's not something to be dismissed by those who are attempting to manage a crisis. Uh, and we'll, I'll get into that a little bit later, but it's important to remember that journalism, and when I say journalism, I'm talking about good journalism, is storytelling. Um, accurate storytelling, not fiction. And someone once said that really, good journalism is simply a nation talking to itself. And I think that's a very apt description of what it is. So, if, it's a, if, it's, if good journalism is a nation talking to itself, then you want to make sure that all the voices are heard. You don't want this to be a one-sided conversation. So you want information coming from both sides of the equation. So while journalists want to tell stories and they want to tell them well and completely and accurately, those goals are not always shared by those who are in positions to control the flow of information. And that's just a fact of life. And most journalists understand that. They understand that there's a, uh, uh, a relationship there that may not be always perceived as being mutually beneficial. For example, let's look at the military and war. Uh, and uh, as uh, Dick pointed out, I've covered my, my fair share of those kinds of things from, from Vietnam to uh, for just about every, almost every war on the planet, I think, up until the Gulf War. I did not cover that one. Anybody who's been in the military, and I have, you know that the military wants to divulge, and this is just a fact, the military, for very good reasons, wants to divulge as little information as infrequently as possible, right? Whereas journalists want as much information as often as possible. So there you have these two diametrically opposed forces there. You, this, this situation can result in conflict, and it often does, though it needn't be always resulting in conflict. Uh, can journalists blame the military for this position? I don't think so. After all, the element of surprise is critical to a successful military campaign. You're not going to broadcast your plans to the enemy by announcing through the media exactly how you plan to attack. I think most reporters understand that. They're not expecting to get that kind of information. Some of them might get it sometimes, and uh, sometimes they don't know they're getting it, and they may divulge information which can uh, cause a problem or could create a, 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 a possible disaster. Uh, you may all remember the infamous scene of uh, Geraldo drawing a line in the sand in that Afghanistan, saying, here's where we are, right? Well, of course, if you've got the enemy watching that on CNN, they can pretty well figure out where you are, and then in will come something that you don't want to see, like some kind of a rocket or a missile or whatever, and uh, that, that's, a, that's a problem. So you, most journalists understand this. And the same kind of analogy can be applied to national disasters. What happened on September 11th of 2001, 
or what happened in Oklahoma City in 1995, or what happened at Columbine in 1999, uh, or more recently at several schools across our country where we had these sort of copycat shootings taking place in, in, in a tragic way. So authorities may have legitimate reasons for withholding information from the media. For example, some information may tip off perpetrators of an attack if they haven't already been apprehended. So you don't want to give that information out. You've got to be careful about what you're saying. And if you do give information like that out, it may make their apprehension more difficult or possibly even impossible. At the same time, authorities also know something else. They also know that providing accurate information following a disaster is always beneficial, for the most part, to their ultimate objective. And I think there's nothing worse than a dearth of information if you're a reporter. I mean, that is anathema. That is a reporter's living hell if you're trying to cover a story and you can't get information. So what happens is when you don't get the information, then that feeds the rumor monster. Rumors begin to evolve, and they kick on a life of their own. And once rumors get started, they're almost impossible to stop. So rule number one, I say, is quite simply, more information is better. Good information fills the void where people in sympathy, empathy, and who are living the disaster need to see and feel and hear what's happening. And that's an important role of the media. Um, journalism is an absolute necessity, I believe, in this information-laden world. It serves as a tool to focus the communal conscience. People need to be told what's important, what to concentrate on, and how to address it. In my experience, whether it was covering the eruption of Mount St. Helens back in the 80s or the Mississippi River floods in 1993, good, reliable information can actually save lives. You can tell people, for example, giving the media that kind of information allows them to convey to the people or to the public where they should not go, for example, as in the case of the floods along the Mississippi, which bridges you shouldn't try to cross. Rich bridges were, were not safe. But in order to do this effectively, there needs to be a, a media policies and procedures system in place. And most journalists understand that. We are, most of us who've been doing this for a long time, at least, uh, understand when you go to cover a, a disaster or a crisis or an event that requires some kind of managing, that there is a system in place, and you learn to work within that system. You don't work outside the system always. Now, there, isn't, there are exceptions to that rule. Uh, one of the things that Jill didn't talk about, uh, and this was the original, the first Gulf War, was this war was a, uh, this particular event that didn't last very long, just a few a hundred hours or so, uh, was trying, they were trying to manage this thing in a way that they were not allowing reporters to go out into the field with the, with the troops. Uh, very few soldiers got out into the desert to see what was going on. So what happened? You could, it's predictable. Uh, Bob Simon, who was working, I think, at CBS at the time, and his crew, they decide, to hell with this, we're taking off, we're going down the road. After all, Bob Simon, who is somebody I know from my Vietnam days, that's what we did. We just we would go out to a place out on the, uh, uh, someplace in, in Benoit, outside of, the, uh, outside of Saigon, and say, you see a Huey sitting there, and say, where are you guys headed? We're headed toward, we're headed toward Nha Trang, we're headed toward, uh, we're headed toward the Parrot's Peak, or something like that. And he would say, well, can I go with you? And they say, sure, hop on. And that was it. You take off and you go with them. You didn't, know, you didn't know when you were going to get back. You never know what you're going to see. But you just went because that was where the story, you thought what the story might be. Bob Simon, one of the old road runners of Vietnam, like the rest of us, decided to hell with this. We're going to, I'm going to take off. I'm going to see what's going on. And he did. Unfortunately for Bob, because he got down the road into, on the border of Kuwait, he was captured by the, uh, by the Iraqis and taken to Baghdad where he was held uh, as a prisoner, along with his crew, for several, I guess, for a month or two, something like that. And uh, he survived it and came out okay. It wasn't a pleasant experience, but he did what he thought he had to do. 
So I think what that means is most of us, most of the journalists that, you're, that, that I work with over my career, understand that there needs to be a media center, some place where you go to get information. And normally, these are some distance from the offices of the, uh, the crisis communication teams that, they, that the, uh, people will erect, and, uh, or the spokesperson or the emergency operations center to ensure that the media are not in the middle of the action and you know, they don't want us to be getting in the way. Um, if there is a visual, for example, a fire or a rescue operation, you don't want to make the media center in such a remote site that, that the media can't see what's going on because then they may not show up, and if they don't show up, then you'll lo they lose their confidence in you, and it may appear that you are hiding something, and then you have this whole problem of suspicion and uh, what, what, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to manage us? And that gets the media very upset, and suddenly you've got a really uh, difficult adversarial rep, uh, relationship. Locations for interviews and press briefings need to be decided by this team. And if it's done properly, it'll be handled properly, and reporters will work within the constraints of this. One thing you don't want to do is change the rules that you've already established for the media. If the media are, are currently required to be escorted someplace during a, a crisis, then they should, then they should be, be required to be escorted. Things should be considered and preparations made now to find people who can escort media during a crisis. If they're not required to be escorted, then you don't require them in a crisis. You just let them do what they want to do. If there are special circumstances that would require them to be escorted, such as a safety hazard, then they need to be advised of this up front. And once again, they will work with you. They will work with the media. They will work with the, with the crisis team. Uh, any change in the way the media are dealt with during a crisis may change the views of the reporter. And it's important that they feel that you aren't trying to hide anything from them. There's nothing worse and to have a pack of reporters convinced that you're trying to hide something from them because then they really become much more aggressive and they start digging and they start listening to all kinds of uh, uh, different sources and they're picking up rumors and they're picking up bits of information here and there and suddenly you've lost control of the story. You're not able to control it in a way that is going to be beneficial to you or to the public. Um, reporters may ask to speak to staff or at a school they might want to talk to faculty or students who are involved with or what have, you know, might have been affected by some crisis that's taken place in the school. And some crisis managers attempt to restrict all interviews to the primary spokesperson or the backup spokesperson or the technical expert. And that may or may not be a good thing. One thing to remember, however, is that reporters do have the right to interview anyone they want to. And if they don't get the answers they want from you, they'll get them from someone else. It's just that simple. Uh, they're all after the story. All reporters are motivated by one thing, get the story. Because that's what their producers, that's what their editors tell them to do. And if they don't do it, and they don't do it consistently, they will lose their jobs. So there is pressure on the reporters to get the story. If you're in the way, they will go right over you to get it if they have to. So. Often reporters want a different angle from the reporter standing next to them. They don't want all to have the same story. They want something different, so they're looking for different angles to stories. That's just the way the nature of the beast. Uh, if the possibility is there to provide them with what they want, you might consider it very carefully if you're the person in the position of handing out information to reporters. But once again, all media need to be treated equally. What is given to one such as access to an area affected by the crisis, needs to be given to all. If you start showing favoritism, if somebody begins to get the feeling that, hey, why is the New York Times getting over here and getting this stuff, and I can't, you know, that creates a real problem, and you've got a, a system of, of rivalry beginning to evolve within the ranks of the media, and suddenly you've lost control of the story again. So the key to effective crisis communication is to be prepared before a crisis occurs. You need to have all these systems in place beforehand. And of course, that's what we're going to be hearing tonight, I believe, and certainly with what Jill's doing and what the other panelists will talk about. That is a, a system that uh, allows for effective crisis communication. You're not scrambling at the last minute to create a system. It's already there. 
Uh, former White House Press Secretary Marlon Fitzwater once said that good crisis communication is based on a system already in place. When there's a crisis, you just tighten it up and make it better. If you routinely had a daily press briefing, you would tighten it up and make it three times a day during a crisis. A crisis is no time to design a new system. You don't want to be caught doing that. And <clears throat> but really, I'll go back to what I was saying before, in a crisis, the best course of, course of action is to be forthcoming and honest and do what it takes to facilitate stories. That's what the media want. And that's what the public wants. And the media, the media are the conduit between you, between the story, between the event, the crisis, and the public. That's their role in our society. The media are going to write and air stories with or without the help of the crisis management team. So it's in the best interest of the crisis team to, uh, to participate in a story, even if it's a negative story, in order to have your position correctly represented. And I go back to what Jill was saying earlier about the Abu Ghraib situation. It was, not a, it was not a positive story. It was a negative story all the way around. But if, had it been handled differently, it would have been uh, presented differently by the media. The alternative is for the media to write that a government official would not respond to our inquiries, something like that, which only fuels suspicion and rumors and gets the public upset. Um, in a crisis, you want to bring all the key players into a room and get all the facts straight. You want to never tell more than you know. Don't freelance what you think and constantly update reporters. It's something you have to do. Keep them updated. Um, reporters have to get information, and if you don't give, it, give them anything, they're going to report rumors, and that's just a fact. Um, check quickly here. One of the things it might be helpful to share with you are some observations about covering disaster, war, and tragedy. And let me begin just very quickly with a couple of bullet points. Um, and the first one is a little bit of knowledge goes a very long way. People who have just survived a traumatic event, for example, are incredibly in, are inarticulate. Uh, and having covered everything from plane crashes to hurricanes to tornadoes to earthquakes, I, I can attest to that. Fires, mudslides in California, I mean, whatever disaster there was, I think I've covered it. And people are stressed to the max when these things happen. It's part of the a physiological response. They have a hard time saying what their experience means. So good journalists, if they know this, will stick with straightforward questions. A good storyteller can rely on observation and description to fill in and convey meaning rather than asking sources who are struggling to string sentences together to do so. In other words, you don't walk up to somebody and ask something inane like, so how does it feel about, you know, how do you feel about losing your entire family? You know, something stupid like that. Well, you, you often hear that. I mean, I've actually heard people say things like, how do you feel about this? Well, well how do you think I feel? You know, I'm jumping with joy, you know, please. A solid foundation in the values of journalism. Journalists cover disasters to tell the story. That's what their job is. To take readers and viewers to a place where they can't go on their own and to inspire people to help. And I can recall in my own case once being in Cambodia and uh, it ran across a hospital in downtown Phnom Penh. This is 1975. The city was surrounded by Khmer Rouge. It was under, we were under constant rocket attack. And here was this little hospital run by these two Canadian sisters who were nurses from Canada and they had a about 45 to 50 babies many of them barely beyond incubator, incubator stage and these children were suffering like you couldn't believe but they were trying to keep them fed and tried to keep them nourished in the midst of this horrible war and I just thought to myself wow this is these people are almost saintly you know so I wrote a story put it out, it went on the front page of the Tribune, went all over the country, and within about four days of that story appearing, I, got a, I, I went back to the uh, little hospital, and the nurses were there, and they said, you won't believe what's happening. People are wiring money and help so we can feed these children. And by the end of, a, of the two weeks, about two weeks after that, they had received something like fifteen or twenty thousand dollars from people who had just seen that story that I had written. So journalists can help. They can help in a, in a very significant way. Um, 
human suffering evokes a human response. And you know, how do journalists react when faced with hungry children and despondent parents? You know, what obligation do reporters have to share food, water, other sources, resources with the people that they encounter? And I always found myself trying to do that up to a point, but you can't feed an entire refugee camp, for example. When I used to go to refugee camps in Thailand where you had boat people and, and, and uh, Cambodian refugees, you can't do that. But you can, you can try to do something. You can try to help. What you try to do is make sure that the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, knows that there's a problem. That's how you help. Um, I think the best stories are those in which reporters see themselves as a conduit, uh, the means by which a source can tell his or her story. Um, and I think it's embarrassing to talk to a person who suffered through an, a horrific event. It can be tough on the reporter, too. Some journalists feel guilty for not being able to do more. You know, you arrive at a scene and people say, are you a doctor? And you say, no, I'm a journalist. And they go, oh, you know. Well, I mean, you shouldn't feel guilty about that because you can provide, you can bring help. You can bring the doctors. You can bring the food. You can bring the medicine. You can bring the other kinds of assistance. That's what you do. And I think that there, uh, those, are, those are very important points to, to remember. Um, so I'll just close here and, and say essentially the key to successful crisis communication is to think of the media as a partner and not as an adversary. And I think if that can happen and, and reporters begin to see that there is a real partnership here, that they have a role to play in helping to make this crisis better or to try to resolve something, then you are in the position, they are in a position of feeling a part of the, part of the process and not part of the problem. And I think that's very important. I don't think any journalist wants to be perceived as being somebody who impedes assistance coming to people who are, have suffered a uh, horrible tragedy or disaster. They want to make sure that that help arrives, and that's how they can do it. But they can't do it unless they have good information. So thank you very much. Ron, thank you. Um, you know, what's extraordinary about this panel is they've, they're students of the art of communications in various ways, but they're also practitioners of the art. I'm very privileged to have you all. Thank you, Ron. Really appreciate it. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Yost Pennings. Dr. Pennings is the associate professor of, uh, in the, our Department of ACES, Agriculture and Consumer Economics, uh, in the Marketing and Decision Sciences Group. He's also <clears throat> Uh, an adjunct professor in the decision sciences at uh, Vaninigen uh, University, is that right? Close? <laughs> in the Netherlands. Um, and really his research has covered both continents um, and focused very specifically on something that we really haven't talked about here and that is how do what you say, how do you communicate, how does that change from one culture to another in a crisis? in that how do you frame your communications if your audience perhaps is German or Dutch or American or Japanese or some, some other nationality? Is there, is there a difference? And I think he spent a significant amount of time studying precisely that issue um, and, and has written more than 50 papers, Referee Journal and some others, that others have looked at his work and said, yeah, there's something there. I first uh, was on the stage with Dr. Pennings uh, and listened to him uh, a couple years ago. And, and quite frankly, I was, as each one of these individuals, I was taken aback by what I saw because it was really so insightful. Um, and uh, there's a saying in the business, uh, it only takes one mad cow. Uh, and if we think about that, right now, one mad cow can shut down an entire beef industry can turn an entire country inside out, can take down trading partners and put into question the entire food chain. Uh, and so with that in mind, let's look at how nations have dealt with these kinds of questions. Dr. Penix. Thank you very much, Dick, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I would like to share tonight uh, research uh, that we are conducting at the University of Illinois, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology, Kansas State University, and Wageningen University 
And this is research that deals with understanding consumer behavior in times of crisis. When you are a policymaker and there's a crisis, you have quite a challenge. Because first, you have to try to eliminate the risk associated with the crisis itself. And then secondly, you have to respond to the reactions of consumers that are triggered by that crisis. And that is basically the motivation for the research that we started back in 1999. And the objective is to come up with a framework to analyze consumer behavior in times of crisis. And based on that knowledge, we try to come up with some tools for policymakers to better respond to uh, the crisis. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can get a better understanding of the underlying decision-making process of consumers in times of crisis. And we are going to use that knowledge to come up with tools for uh, policymakers that have to respond to that crisis. And I'm going to do that in the context of mad cow disease, or BSE. I'm going to give you a quick uh, background information on that. A mad cow, or BSE, was first uh, detected in the United Kingdom in 86. It is a neurological disorder in cattle, and it is fatal. And in the 90s, it spread in uh, Europe, and also in, now it is in North America. We had a case uh, in 2003 in Canada, and in 2004, we had a case here in the United States. In the beginning of the 90s, uh, scientists have found a relationship between mad cow and variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is a neurological disorder in humans, and it is fatal. In 1996, we had the first victim in the United Kingdom, and it was a victim. Scientists basically showed that she was dying because she consumed beef that came from a BSE cows. And as you can imagine, that triggered an enormous response uh, during that time in the UK. When you think about crisis, and clearly as an economist, we think about economic consequences. The crisis itself has an economic consequences. In the case of mad cow, we are losing cattle. So producers and the industry lose money. But the economic costs are even greater when you look at the response of consumers that are triggered by that crisis. And an excellent illustration is the case in Germany. In Germany, when you look at beef consumption, and we have here a graph, and basically on the horizontal axis is a timeline going from July 99 till July 01. On the vertical axis, we have uh, beef consumption. In Germany, beef consumption uh, shows a seasonal pattern. Normally, in the fall and the winter, uh, beef consumption is increasing. In the spring and the summer, beef consumption is decreasing. And then, again, in the fall and winter, the holiday season, beef consumption is picking up again. In, in um, November 26, 2000, we had the first BSE case in Germany. And as you can see in this graph, normally during that time in November, beef consumption would go up. Here we see a dramatic decline in beef consumption. It is really dramatic. Mind you that we are talking about one single cow. And just to put things in perspective, the probability that you are going to eat beef from a cow that has BSE in Germany is virtually zero. Even if you eat beef from a cow that is contaminated with BSE, the probability that you're going to develop Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease is virtually zero. Hence, contracting Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease from eating beef is zero. And still we see this dramatic response in Germany. In fact, the beef industry is almost bankrupt in Germany. Today, the beef consumption in Germany is still lower than prior to November 2006. Basically, they never recovered. 
number of BSE cases in Germany is small, a handful. Just to show you how a single cow can have enormous consequences because of the responses of uh, consumers. And so we were very interested in finding out why are consumers responding the way they do. And when you think about a crisis, then two components play a very important role. First one is the risk content. What is exactly the risk? And in this case, it is contracting kreutzfeldt jakob disease. And then the other component is, what is the probability that I will be exposed to that risk content? And behavior is driven by perceptions and attitudes. And in times of crisis, risk attitude plays a very important role. Risk attitude is your general predisposition towards the risk content. Or put it differently, it is the extent to which you like or dislike the risk content. In this case, kreutzfeldt jakob disease. And then risk perceptions play a very important role. Risk perception is your interpretation of the likelihood that you are going to be exposed to that risk content. And it is a perception. Your interpretation about the probability that you're going to be exposed to that risk content may not match up with the true probabilities. When you are risk averse and you perceive risk, then you will exhibit risk avoidance behavior. And in the case of the mad cow, that means that you're going to reduce your beef consumption. So basically, we developed a very simple framework in which the decision-making process of consumers is driven by risk attitudes and risk perceptions. The reason that we did this is because we were interested in what is the main driver of behavior. Is it risk attitude or risk perception? Because that will have an impact on the way we communicate with the public. For example, if we, found, if we find a research that risk perception is the main driver of behavior, then maybe communicating the true probabilities of being exposed to the risk content may be a very effective strategy. Because if we communicate well the true probabilities, that will impact our risk perception, and hence that will impact the behavior of consumer. The way we communicate the true probabilities is also very important because we can package the same information differently. That's called often framing. And the time is too short to uh, spend time on the way we frame things. However, if on the other hand it is risk attitude that is the main driver of consumer behavior, then communicating the true probabilities of being exposed to the risk content may not be your best strategy. If risk attitude is driving your behavior, then providing information about the risk content itself may be very effective because that is going to influence risk attitude and basically eliminating or reducing the risk content. And in the context, context of the mad cow disease, that means slaughtering all cows in susceptible age ranges. And that basically happened in the United Kingdom. In the 90s, we slaughtered hundreds of thousands of cows in the United Kingdom, because the government at that time wanted to communicate that we are going to eliminate the risk content. And the only way to do that effectively is slaughtering cows in susceptible <coughs> age ranges. Again, that strategy is only very effective if behavior is mainly driven by risk attitudes. So since 1999, we follow basically our consumers in Germany, the Netherlands, and the United States with respect to mad cow and BC. And I'm going to share with you some empirical results of a study that we did in February 2004. So in February 2004, we had already BSC in the Netherlands and in Germany, and we just discovered a cow here in Canada, uh, in, I'm sorry, in uh, the United States in Washington State. And in this study, what we do is we measure, uh, using psychometric scales, risk attitudes, risk perceptions of consumers, and then we ask them questions about their beef consumption, uh, whether they trust governmental agencies that put out information, and so on and so forth. 
What I'm going to share with you tonight is based on 300 uh, German consumers, uh, 326 Dutch consumers, and about 600 uh, US consumers. And the first question that we uh, always ask is, what do you think about risk contact? In this case, what do you think about contracting Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease from eating beef will do to you? What is the knowledge about Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease? And what's very interesting to find is that in both countries, United States, Germany, and the Netherlands, there is a lot of heterogeneity about the knowledge. Some people do believe that if you contract Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, you will die. And some people will think, you know, you get ill, it's like the flu, and, you know, after, after a week, you're okay again. We also see significant different knowledge levels across countries. In the United States, there is a significant group that, of consumers that think that Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease is just like the flu. Well, when we shift to Germany, there's a large percentage of people that believe that if I contract Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, that I will die. We cannot recover from it. So there is a lot of heterogeneity in the knowledge level about risk content across the countries, but also within the country. We ask questions about, are you concerned about eating beef? And there you see that the Germans are most concerned, basically followed by the United States and then the Netherlands. Trust is very important. If you're going to communicate as a decision maker, whether it's the beef industry or governmental agencies, then clearly only when you are really trusted will your message have an impact. And as we see from uh, this sample is that Dutch consumers trust the government the most, followed by US consumers, and basically German consumers do not trust their governmental agencies. And that has a reason because the German uh, government uh, basically denied having BSE in Germany for a long, long period, while exports were already in 99, saying that BSE made uh, their way to Germany. And then what is the response of uh, the media coverage and about uh, uh, the, f the fact that we find BSE cases? Do we eat less beef? In the United States, about 9% of the people indicated that they had reduced their beef consumption because of the BSE cow in Washington State. In the Netherlands, it's, it, in, at two, in 2004, it was still 17%. And then Germany, four years after the first case, still about 29% of consumers were indicating that they reduced their beef consumption, which basically confirms with our hard data when we look at beef consumption in, in, in Germany. And then we measured risk attitudes and risk perceptions in these three countries. And what I did here in this graph is on the vertical axis we have risk attitudes uh, going from risk averse to risk seeking and on the horizontal axis uh, we have uh, risk perception going from the left, from low, risk, low perceived risk to the right, high perceived risk. As you can see here, Germany is re really in the northeast corner, basically meaning that in Germany people perceive relatively high uh, risk level and they are relatively risk averse. Uh, with respect, when we compare the Dutch with the uh, Americans, we see that the Dutch are a little bit more risk averse than uh, the Americans, but that the Americans perceive a little bit more risk than the Dutch. What's very interesting is that the Netherlands and Germany, of course, are neighboring countries but they respond very, very differently, and that is further confirmed here because they have very different risk attitudes and risk perceptions. What is, interestingly is, what is interesting is that about 30 years ago, a lot of studies uh, have been conducted about risk-taking behavior of managers across countries. And when you look back at these studies, these studies would tell you that Dutch managers and American managers are pretty similar in the risk avoidance behavior compared to Americans. And basically, we confirm this in this study. And it's interesting because the domain is very different. We are dealing here with mad cow disease, and they were dealing uh, with risk-taking behavior of, of managers. So there are some, clearly some cultural differences. We started um, to get an interest in what is exactly the influence of risk attitude or risk perception on behavior. 
Because clearly, if we can determine what is driving behavior, then again, we can come up with an effective uh, response tool. And in this graph, I show basically uh, how we related the risk attitudes and risk perceptions of consumers in the United States to behavior. In this case, behavior was operationalized as whether or not you had reduced your beef consumption. Uh, we run a statistical model in which risk attitude or risk perception were basically predicting what a consumer uh, was going to do. In the United States, we find that risk attitude is the main driver, not risk perception. That, as we will see in a minute, will have some implications for the way you are going to respond to a crisis like the BZ crisis. In Germany, both risk attitude and risk perceptions were driving behavior. And interestingly, in the Netherlands, it's not risk attitude, but risk perception that is driving their behavior. And in the Netherlands, what the Dutch government did, in contrast to UK and Germany, is that in the Netherlands, the Dutch government, after finding their first PSE case, they did not uh, went for a massive slaughter of susceptible cows. What the Dutch government did instead was communicating the true probability of contracting kreutzfeldt jakob disease. And based on these results, that, is a pretty, that was a pretty good strategy because it's risk perception in the Netherlands that is driving behavior. Hence, communicating true probabilities is pretty effective. When you look at the beef consumption, for example, in the Netherlands, then beef consumption dropped a little bit and then picked up again, in a, and hence a very different pattern uh, compared to, uh, to Germany. We started in the beginning of this year together with Kansas State University also to focus on our export markets because clearly it's very interesting to know how our domestic consumers are responding in the case that the industry is affected by a crisis. But in the case of, be uh, of beef, uh, we are big exporters of, of beef uh, to, for example, Japan. And so we started uh, doing a similar research in Canada, which is a competitor uh, with respect to beef exports. Uh, Japan and Mexico, and I'm going to focus a little bit on, on, on Japan here. When we had our first PSE case here in the United States, not only did we have a response of uh, U.S. consumers, but the response in our exports markets were way more dramatic than here at home. About 55% of the Japanese indicated that because of the BSE call here in the United States, they reduced their beef consumption. Because of this dramatic response of the Japanese, the government in Japan basically uh, was forced to ban U.S. beef. So as a policymaker, it's not only uh, important that you understand how domestic consumers are responding, but if you're an exporting uh, industry, you better want to make sure how export markets are responding. And Japanese consumers are responding in a very different way than uh, U.S. Uh, consumers. That is, in Japan, there are different drivers for, for their behavior than in, in the United States, and hence you may want to consider different communication strategies for the Japanese market than for your uh, domestic market. So how should policymakers respond to consumers' reactions? And I'm going to focus a little bit on, on the whole BEC case. I think, first of all, it's very important on a micro level uh, that we try to get a better understanding of how people actually behave. And clearly, perceptions and attitudes are important. And here at Illinois, I think we have made great progress in modeling behavior. Uh, in the economics department, agriculture economics department, in the department of psychology, we work on psychometric models that can help us understand and predict behavior. The simple model that I showed you about risk attitude and risk perception driving behavior uh, had an extremely good performance in predicting whether or not a particular consumer was going to reduce uh, beef consumption. When you look at the results of 2004, then it's clear that in Germany and the United States, if there is a BSE uh, or in general a food uh, contamination uh, crisis, then eliminating the risk content is a very effective strategy. So put resources to focus on <coughs> basically reducing the risk associated with the, with the crisis is uh, money well spent. Uh, in the Netherlands, where risk perception was the main driver, 
uh, communicating the true probabilities has already a great impact on how consumers respond uh, to the crisis. Clearly, there are cross-cultural uh, differences that we need to better understand. Again, it was very interesting to see that two neighboring countries are responding so differently. Cultural differences play an enormous role how people think about risk, how they perceive risk, and how they respond uh, to a crisis. And it's, again, ongoing research here at the University of Illinois. Uh, and that is basically uh, my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. We're going to switch over a projector uh, here real quickly. But, uh, you know, one of the things that when I listened to Yost the first time and again that I thought was particularly uh, interesting is we're a country of many cultures. And we have cultures within the culture. So it's not just the United States, but is if we have a crisis and we have a risk communication, how do you talk to the different cultures? I think uh, Chicago alone has more than 70 languages has literally papers in 40 or 50 of those languages that serve communities. We clearly have Hispanic communities. We have black communities. We have uh, ethnic communities of various types. And I'm not sure they all hear the same way. So I, I, it would be interesting for me as we do this to try and apply this model to the United States in terms of communications, because I think we have a very complex challenge as we do that. Uh, to finish up this evening, uh, Frankly, the, the reason this all happened is uh, Dr. Vince Govello uh, agreed to come here and spend three days in Illinois and to help us. Uh, Dr. Covello is uh, truly uh, a world expert in risk communications. Um, he was telling me a story at lunch today about uh, uh, his time at uh, New York University and when he was in the medical school as an MD, and he had students come to him and say, hey, I'd like to... Uh, uh, have a course that we'll do ourselves on how doctors can better communicate with patients and how do we do that. Um, and uh, went to the dean and said, we'd like to do it, and said, well, there's, that's not science. And there wasn't a body of science for that. And so he went on and got his PhD in psychology and has helped create the science. He has more than 25 books and 75 uh, academic papers to his credit that he's either authored or uh, helped edit. And uh, more importantly, uh, he's helped frame this field called risk communications and train, uh, I don't know, countless people in the United States and around the world in how to deal with those crises. Um, anybody remember what Rudy Giuliani did after 9-11 in terms of communicating with the public? You thought he did a pretty good job? He wrote that script with Dr. Cavello's help almost seven years before it was used. And we'd like to talk about how you go about writing a script for 911 before it ever happens. And that's precisely what risk communications and message mapping and the body of work that Dr. Cavello has created has, uh, has done. He this morning met with uh, the mayors and city managers and police chiefs and fire chiefs and county emergency managers and sheriff and had a three-hour session on uh, that was just wonderful. And for the next two days at the Institute uh, here, Fire Service Institute, we will do a two-day workshop uh, led by Dr. Uh, Cavello on a whole series of scenarios and try and create some new message maps. So thank you for joining us from New York. And uh, let me switch the computer over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before I begin, I'd like to uh, uh, link my presentation. We've heard a perspective on crisis communication from different fields. We started off with a practitioner uh, talking about the communications during the um, Second Gulf War and afterward 
Uh, we heard the journalist perspective on crisis communication uh, from around the world. We heard the economist decision-making perspective. What I would like to do in this last presentation this evening is share with you the medical, psychological, public health perspective on crisis communication. Um, more specifically, um, my specialty for the past 30 years is crafting messages in crises. And for the purpose of this evening, I'd, I'd like to share three central points that uh, I'll explore in more detail. The first is, I would argue, the most important, and the one that is often the most difficult to absorb, let alone to practice, and that is that in high-stress situations, the rules of communication, effective communication, change. Uh, since that's my first message and my most important, I'll repeat it again, that in high-stress situations, the rules of communication for effective communication change. We quite literally enter into a different universe where what governs effectiveness is very different from what's effective in a low-stress situation. The second point I'm going to make is that, and this is, uh, was echoed in, in the introduction to me, is that over the past 30 years, we can now talk confidently about a science of effective crisis communication or high-stress communication. Crisis communication is a subfield, a subfield of subdiscipline of high-stress communication. And now we can talk very confidently about a science, and especially in a university setting, being able to talk about a science gives us the confidence to be able to proceed. Obviously, there's an art and the practice of communication, but there's a, a solid scientific basis. And the third message is that the key to effective communication in a high-stress situation, such as a crisis, is the same for effectiveness in virtually any endeavor, human endeavor, that the more we're willing to anticipate, prepare, and practice, be you an athlete, an economist, or any other field of human endeavor, that the more we're willing to put in up front, the more effective will be the product at the end. With that in mind, uh, I'd like to make the presentation actually broader than just dealing with crisis. Uh, I would argue that every day offers us some ability to use the tools, skills of effective crisis communication. For example, how many have had an argument with a loved one? An argument with a loved one. Well, whether or not you have observed or called it risk communication, crisis communication, high stress communication, that's what you've been doing. And therefore, I would argue what I'm about to share with you is as applicable to arguments with family members as it is, for example, to communicating about pandemic influenza, communicating about war, communicating about hurricanes and disasters. Uh, a second is how many have had an argument with a coworker? An argument with a coworker. Um, it might be over whether or not somebody uh, left their lunch in the refrigerator too long and now it's gotten old moldy and um, or didn't clean up with them after the coffee or let alone having to do with meeting deadlines. But the, the area that I've focused on most over the past 30 years is communicating in large-scale crises and emergencies. For example, over the past year and a half, I've been involved in communications about tsunami in Southeast Asia, SARS, avian flu. And uh, if you're interested in the scientific literature on this, uh, the, the good news I can share, especially in a university setting, is when I mentioned that there is a scientific basis, we recently did a review, a, a bibliographic review on how many articles are there present that have titles such as high stress communication, risk communication, crisis communication. Uh, 30 years ago, when we did this bibliographic review, we found less than a handful of articles that could be called scientific. Now there are 8,000 peer-reviewed scientific articles, nearly 2,000 books published by scientific publishers, major reviews by the leading scientific organizations in the world, such as the National Academy of Sciences. Um, my most recent contribution to this, I, I share this in part because the book is free. Uh, it's a United Nations World Health Organization publication. Uh, you can easily access the book e either by going to the WHO wor website or going to Google and simply Googling the title. It's a specific subfield of the field of crisis communication. That is, it deals with communicating with the media in a crisis, particularly a public health emergency. Uh, in addition to the fact that it's free, it's a digital book, it's 250 pages long, there's, there's three very specific reasons I might refer you to the book. Number one, if you ever intend to deal with the media, it has about a thousand do's and don'ts. We heard earlier from Dean Yates, a number of do's and don'ts. This is uh, approaching it from a spokesperson's perspective as opposed to the media perspective. How should you craft your messages most effectively to be most effective when dealing with the media? Now, a second reason, as I mentioned, is nearly 8,000 articles. The book includes a 1,000 
um, item reference bibliography. Uh, this is only dealing with that small subsection of crisis communication, which is dealing with the media. And a third reason I, I suggest you might take a look at it, because it is the United Nations publication, World Health Organization publication, as you might imagine, the issue that was brought up in our last presentation about diversity is very key. How do you communicate effectively through the media to the world in a very diverse world, multicultural world? And there's a, a chapter devoted to diversity and how one communicates in a very diverse world. Uh, related to the rules of communication, uh, what I've selected out from the nearly 8,000 articles and 2,000 books, I've selected out three principles of effective high-stress crisis communication for consideration this evening. The first principle, and I would argue that all of these may sound reasonable and sensible, and yet they're very infrequently practiced in the practical world of communications. Uh, the first principle is when people are stressed and upset, they often want to know that you care before they care what you know. How many believe that sounds sensible and reasonable? Um, it's the basis, for example, in the medical profession of bedside manners, uh, that before you would share facts, that you would share first your empathy, your caring, your active listening skills. The second principle, and I'm going to go back to each of these in turn. I've selected again out three for consideration. Um, they've actually been the basis for much of the research that I've done over the past 30 years. I found these propositions both intellectually fascinating, both as well as practically useful for the purposes of communicating in a crisis. The second principle is that when people are stressed and upset, they often process information at a lower grade level, educational level, than their uh, prepared to. People process information more typically at about four grade levels below their average educational level. In other words, there's a the deterioration that takes place in the ability to process information that might otherwise be easily accessible in a low stress situation suddenly becomes inaccessible to the human mind in high stress situations. And the third principle I'd like to share uh, is one that also, as I argue, is a challenge because it's, it's so atypical not part of our normal communication skill set. And that is that in high stress situations, when people are stressed and upset, they often can process no more than three messages at a time. They can only process three messages at a time. Uh, I said I would go back to each of these. Let's take that first principle that in high stress situations, people, when they're stressed and upset, they want to know that you care before they care what you know. The origins of this particular principle go back to the origins of Western civilization itself. For example, the Greek philosopher Aristotle. It was Aristotle who first pointed out that the concept of trust, which has come up several times during the presentations this evening, is fundamental to effective crisis communication. But what is trust? Well, it was Aristotle and others that first speculated that trust is made up of many different attributes. When you say you trust an individual, when you say you trust a government, when you say you trust an organization, that there are many different attributes of the individual or organization that are coming to play in making that decision. Uh, one of those attributes we heard, for example, early about the prison scandal was the issue of honesty, openness, transparency, which is one of the elements of trust. A second element, we heard this in the discussion of journalists, is that they depend upon accurate information. Uh, so therefore, knowledge, uh, expertise, accurate information becomes an essential part of the trust dimension. But the one that I would like to focus on, though, is the attribute of that you're perceived either as an individual or an organization as caring, empathetic, uh, compassionate, uh, let alone listening to those who would be suffering or listening to those involved in the issue. Uh, because of the importance of trust, and, and more specifically the importance of compassion, uh, notice, for example, in this last slide that there's, that although all three of those factors plus others, there's a miscellaneous category of trust factors such as perseverance and consistency, that in high stress situations there is an interesting shift that takes place. And the shift is that in low stress situations, people primarily make the decision of trust on the basis of the weight they give to expertise, knowledge, and wisdom. Again, in low stress situations, people put the primary emphasis, the weight, 
in deciding if an individual organization is trustworthy on the dimension of expertise, knowledge, and wisdom. And yet, suggested nearly 2,000 years ago, but explored scientifically in the last 30 years, is that it's a fascinating shift takes place. That in high-stress situations, although expertise, knowledge, wisdom is still important, the greater emphasis is given to the caring, empathy, compassion dimension. More specifically, it accounts for as much as 50% of the decision about trust and credibility. This leads to a very important template, and the, another positive good piece of news I can share is that the academic literature on trust, the academic literature on crisis communication, has increasingly been finding its way into the practical part of communication. Um, the practical part is often referred to as templates, ways to organize knowledge based on what we know about how people process information in high-stress situations. One of the most important and powerful of those templates is called the CCO template, with the first C standing for that important dimension of trust, compassion, empathy, listening, caring. The second C referring to conviction, for example, what you know, uh, that you know with conviction X, Y, or Z. And a third dimension of the CCO template is optimism, but evidence-based optimism as opposed to Pollyanna optimism. Probably the best example I can give you of the recognition of the importance of caring and compassion in communicating a crisis was a quote from Mayor Rudolph Giuliani in response to the first question offered up after the 9-11 disaster crisis. Uh, four hours after the crisis had occurred, the mayor was asked a very simple, straightforward, factual question. How many people, Mr. Mayor, do you think have died? As opposed to treating this question as a purely factual question, which he did address later, he treated it as a trust question, an emotional question, and offered up a statement that has become part of the history of communications. The number of casualties is more than anybody can bear ultimately. Uh, let me go to this principle number two. Uh, principle number two is that in high-stress situations, another change takes place, is that people no longer are able to process information at their educational, at their knowledge level. More specifically, in high-stress situations, people process information at four grade levels below their educational level. Um, this is, again, one of these shifts that take place that has great consequences for communications. In low-stress situations, you can communicate to a person and feel confident that you'll be effective if you can communicate at their knowledge level, at their educational level, as a surrogate for their knowledge level. But in high-stress situations, a fundamental change takes place in the way the brain will process information. As I mentioned before, there's a deterioration in the ability to process. Uh, think to yourself, for example, let's say that you enter into a high-stress situation. You wind up, for example, getting off the highway in a neighborhood that is unfamiliar, that looks rather dangerous. And the in individual, you stop, let's say, at a gas station and ask the person for directions. How do I get, for example, back onto the highway? How do I get back home? And the individual shares with the information. They would say, well, at the first light, make a left. When you see the McDonald's, make sure you go straight ahead. Don't turn right. That'll get you right back where you started. Then you continue on, and if you go about three miles, you'll finally see a sign that says that will bring you back on the highway. If you're with a, a partner, you'll probably say to the person, what? What did he say? Well, what happened? Under low-stress situations, you would probably be able to easily repeat back the information that was shared to you by the gas station attendant. Yet in a high-stress situation, a fundamental change takes place that you're no longer able to function at that same level. Um, how this translates into a very specific practical recommendation, the average grade level in the United States is now, according to the U.S. Census, approximately 10 to 12 years of education. The average American has 10 to 12 years of education, which is the AGL, or the average grade level. In order to be effective in a high-stress situation, we have to take the AGL and subtract four which means to be effective in a high-stress situation or crisis requires we speak as if we're talking to a 6th to 8th grader, meaning a 12-year-old. Uh, principle number three, when people are stressed and, and, and upset, they often can only hear three messages at a time. Uh, this is the one that I would argue is probably the most unusual. It's part of a much larger body of knowledge that deals with attention span. 
we've all heard about attention spans. In fact, there's an attention span associated with our evening uh, seminar. Uh, in approximately three minutes, we're about to reach our attention span. We started at, um, at uh, seven o'clock this evening. Um, it was Mark Twain who made this statement that the, the ability of the mind to endure is limited by the ability of the rear to bear. Um, that happens after approximately 90 minutes. After 90 minutes, your ability to pay attention to information deteriorates at a very rapid stage. We're about at that stage now, and I'm going to push you well beyond your attention span by going on for about five minutes more. Uh, this is what your, your mind looks like in terms of attention span. It starts off that you start paying attention at time T0. You move up to time T1. It starts to deteriorate at a slow rate, and then at time T2, it falls off radically. For the purposes of adult learning, T1 occurs at about 60 minutes. T2 occurs at approximately 90 minutes. Uh, how this relates to our discussion is that in low stress situations, uh, research that began formally back in the 1930s and 40s with Bell Laboratories looking at issues such as how many numerical digits can a person remember in a telephone number, concluded that the human mind under conditions of low stress can typically absorb approximately seven messages plus or minus two. But starting in the 1980s, a number of researchers, including myself, questioned this research in terms of its applicability to high stress situations. If individuals could remember, process, for example, in terms of short-term memory, seven messages, bullet points, numbers, in a low stress situation, what would happen in a high stress situation? Put a person under stress, for example, a person who's experienced catastrophe, disaster, loss, suffering. And the major conclusion of that research was that at conditions of high stress, again, a rapid deterioration takes place in the human mind, in the ability to process. It goes from seven to three. Um, one of the articles that interested me in my early part of my career was an article published by a Princeton University professor, published in one of the leading psychological journals. To my surprise, it's received very little attention in the broader field of communications, but nonetheless, very much influenced my decision to explore attention span under conditions of high stress. Uh, the article was called The Magic Number Seven Plus or Minus Two, Some Limits on Our Capacity for Processing Information, uh, by Professor George Miller, published in 1956. Um, the revision we have to do, however, of this article is that it applies to low stress communication. In high stress situations, something very different happens. I've also shared with you, because of time, I'm, I'm gonna have to sh cut short a number of things that I wanted to share with you tonight. Uh, but nonetheless, if you look at the attention span literature, there's a number of other very practical implications of the attention span literature to communicating in any type of high stress, be it an argument with a loved one, be it an argument among coworkers, or being communicating a crisis. For example, I've listed three here just for illustration purposes. The first is called the primacy recency template, which indicates, among other things, that under conditions of high stress, people tend to focus most on that which they hear first and last. Again, in high stress situations, people tend to focus most on that which they hear first and last, least on what they hear between. I do this at home with my own family. Whenever I give a high stress list, I always make sure that the most important items in the list are first and last, expecting that anything in between would be lost because of the nature of the high stress. Second is called the triple T template, and you may have heard this back in high school. How many have heard, tell me what you're gonna tell me, tell me more, tell me again? Well, it turns out that particular model, tell me briefly what you want me to know, tell me more about what you just told me, tell me again, uh, incorporates the notion of repetition, which is a, a fundamental skill in high stress situations. You must repeat yourself several times to be heard, let alone to be remembered. And third is a principle from the attention span literature, and that deals with the asymmetrical focus of the human mind on the conditions of high stress. The template is called 1N equal 3P, which indicates, among other things, that in high stress situations, people focus much more on the negative than the positive in the ratio of three to one. In other words, it takes on average three positives, constructive, solution-oriented messages in order to balance psychologically one negative. Uh, I mentioned that uh, there were three points I wanted to focus on this evening. Uh, 
I've focused on two so far. The third is the notion that to be effective in a high-stress situation requires that which is required of virtually any human endeavor, which is to anticipate, prepare, and practice, to, to plan and prepare. Uh, this leads me to the last and final template that I'd like to share tonight that has direct relevance to not only our arguments with our loved ones, arguments among coworkers, or emergency crisis communication. It's called the APP template, which stands for anticipation, preparation, and practice. Uh, here are three guiding principles of modern crisis communication. Uh, the first has to do with the good news, the good news is that the research now indicates that over 95% of all questions and concerns of virtually any stakeholder involved in that crisis can be predicted in advance. Uh, my first study that explored this particular principle was a study of terminally ill patients. I sat in on over 600 conversations between physicians and patients recording what questions patients asked their physicians. It may or may not be a surprise to you that 50 questions captured virtually 95% of the questions that the patients asked. And of course, the advantage to those who would be communicating, such as a physician to a patient, is that instead of now having to guess what questions patients might ask, such as how long, how sure, how much pain and suffering, should I tell my loved ones and how, that these can be predicted in advance, which leads, to, of course, to the second, if you can predict in advance what people who are stressed and upset will ask you, you can do what? You can start preparing your responses in advance, following principles such as the principles of attention span that I shared earlier. And the third principle of modern crisis communication is that if you can anticipate questions and concerns for any crisis, if you can prepare responses to those anticipated questions in advance, then you should train individuals in the answers. Train them to both in what the answers are to make sure they're accurate, caring, short, brief, timely. Uh, in terms of uh, the anticipate part, uh, there are three dimensions to anticipation. Number one is you would anticipate scenarios. As part of the workshops that will be taking place at the university over the next few days, we'll be dealing with eight different crisis scenarios. Obviously, there's a choice involved here. There are thousands of things that can go wrong. What do you put your emphasis and focus on? The second is to anticipate stakeholders and partners who would be influenced by the information, who is, has a need to know, who has a right to know, who's interested or affected by the issue, let alone, we heard this morning, the import, this, this evening, the importance of coordinating with partners, who would be part of the communication effort in sharing information. And the third is the questions and concerns that would come up as part of those communications. Uh, I've listed here one of the more important uh, research results that we produced over the past 20 years. Uh, we looked at 2,500 disasters and crises with this hypothesis in mind. Although every disaster and crisis is the same, every disaster and crisis is also different. In terms of sameness, we explored this hypothesis. For one particular audience, meaning the media, that although they may ask infinite numbers of questions, that they actually are variations on the themes. In fact, the research of 2,500 news conferences, which was the sample, indicated that 77 questions represent 95% of the universe that reporters ask in a crisis. Interestingly enough, we found that these questions were not taught in journalism school. They were not part of the teaching of students, but through osmosis and through just thinking through the crisis itself, that we found that these 77 questions represented 95% of the universe of questions that reporters ask in a crisis. Is this advantageous to those who would be communicating during a crisis? Well, if 70, these 77 questions, 77 questions, questions such as, what is it most important for people to know? What is most important for people to do? Where can I get credible information? Who's in charge? that these questions represent 95% of the questions that reporters would ask, then you would expect that a crisis communicator would do what? Well, based on the scenarios that are within their purview, that they would prepare responses. Uh, the questions that typically come up are of three types. Uh, again, you can easily access this information through the World Health Organization handbook, which has the 77 questions printed in them. 
There are three general categories of questions. There's factual questions. For example, in every journalism school, they're taught the five W's. Who, what, where, when, why, how. Five W's and one H. Um, but it turns out reporters go well beyond the five W's in terms of the questions they would ask. They also ask emotionally charged questions. Sometimes these may sound stupid. They may sound ridiculous, but how does this make you feel? What would you like to say to the families of the victims? What are you telling your own children? And of course, you could always wing it. You could always make these up along the way, or you can think in advance. If you know that these are questions that might be asked, then you might just think it's your advantage to think about what you would say in advance of the communication. In the same way that those involved in crisis operations argue that a crisis is not the time to hand out business cards, I would argue a crisis is not the time to develop and craft messages. You'll be busy enough, and your mind will be busy enough that you don't want to be developing answers to tough questions during a crisis. What are these tough questions? Well, I'm going to show you a videotape in a second. Uh, because of the late time of the evening, it's going to be a, a humorous, but also has a, a very serious theme to it. Um, these are three examples of the tough questions you can expect in a crisis from virtually any audience, including the media. There'll be false allegations, false allegations, perhaps based on rumor. There'll be guarantee questions. Can you guarantee? Can you promise us with 100% assurance that X, Y, Z will occur, will not occur? What's the very worst case that can happen? Um, for purpose of illustration, I'm going to show uh, one of my favorite of all video clips. I have a very large video library of individuals communicating well and not well. Um, this is fiction, but I would argue that in fiction sometimes comes out truth even more so than in reality. This is an old Bob Newhart program. Um, he accepts a reporter's invitation to do an interview. He asks the question, which I should argue should always be asked, should I prepare? The answer is no. There's ne no necessity to prepare. This will be a chat, a walk in the park. Good morning, Dr. Hartford. Thank you for coming. I hope it's not too early for you. No, I, I had to get up to, to be on television. <laughs> well, I'm glad you relaxed. I'm a little nervous myself. I mean, I've never interviewed a psychologist. Well, don't worry about it. We're ordinary men, you know, one leg at a time. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I start to ramble a little, or if I get into an area I'm not conversant in, you'll help me out, won't you? Don't worry about it. If you get in trouble, just turn it over to me and I'll, I'll wing it. Oh. <laughs> Ten seconds, Ruth. Thanks, Augie. You'll be fine. Here goes. <laughs> Three, two, you're on. Good morning. It's seven o'clock and I'm Ruth Corley. My first guest is psychologist Dr. Robert Hartley. It's been said that today's psychologist is nothing more than a con man, a snake oil salesman flim-flamming innocent people, <laughs> peddling cures for everything from nail-biting to a lousy love life. And I agree. <laughs> we'll ask Dr. Hartley to defend himself after this message. <laughs> was, was that on the air? Oh, that's just what we call a grabber. You know, it keeps the audiences from tuning out. Ten seconds, Ruth. Thanks, Augie. We, we won't be doing any more grabbing, will we? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. From now on, we'll just talk. Three, two, you're on. Dr. Hartley, according to a recently published survey, the average fee for a private session with a psychologist is $40. That's, uh, that's <laughs> about right. Right? I don't think it's right. What other practitioner gets $40 an hour? Uh, my plumber. <laughs> Plumbers guarantee their work, do you? See, I, I don't understand why all of a sudden you... I asked you if you guaranteed your work. <laughs> well, I, I can't guarantee that each and every person that walks through the door is, is going to be cured, you know? You mean you ask $40 an hour and you guarantee nothing? I, I, I validate. Is that your answer? Could, uh, could I have a word with you? 
Chicago is waiting for your answer. Well, uh, sh uh Chicago. Uh, everyone who, who comes in uh, doesn't pay $40 an hour. Do you ever cure anybody? Well, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say cure. So your answer is no. No, no, my, my answer is, is, is not no. Uh, I, I get results. Uh, many of my patients uh, solve their problems and, and go on to become successful. Successful at what? Uh, professional athletes, uh, clergymen. Uh, some go on to, to head large corporations. Uh, one of my patients is, is an elected official. A what? Uh, no, nothing. <laughs> Did you say an elected official? I, I might have, I forget. <laughs> Who is it? Well, I, I, can't, I can't divulge his identity. Why? There is a deranged man out there in a position of power. He's a, he isn't deranged any, anymore. But he was when he came to see you, and you said yourself that you do not give guarantees. After this message, we will meet our choice for Woman of the Year, Sister Mary Catherine. Okay, we're in a commercial. Thanks, Augie. Thank you, Dr. Hartley. You were terrific. I mean, I wish we had more time. We, we had plenty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really enjoyed it. Well, you, you would have enjoyed Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Good morning, sister. It's wonderful of you to come at this hour. If, uh, if I were you, I, I wouldn't get into religion. She'll, she'll chew your legs off. <laughs> Good. Uh, I believe that this particular video well illustrates the importance of anticipation, preparation, and practice. And again, because of the late, uh, uh, lateness of the evening, uh, I'm going to finish my presentation where I began. Um, tell folks what you want them to know, tell them more, tell them again. Uh, my first point this evening was the importance of recognizing that the rules of communication change in high-stress situations. And I gave you various illustrations of how those rules change, such as the shift from focus on expertise and knowledge to the shift to the focus on caring empathy and making the trust decision. The shift from seven to three. Uh, the shift from AGL to AGL minus four as examples of the fundamental changes that take place in the human brain that have to be adapted to to be effective. The second is the good news is that we now have a very rich body of knowledge in order to predict how the brain will respond to information in high stress situations. And the third is that the key to effective communication is anticipation, preparation, and practice. With that, I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you. Well, now it's your turn. Um, I had originally uh, and handed out some cards, but, but we, uh, we have a small enough audience. I'd recommend if any of you have a question, come on forward to the, at, to the microphone and, and please feel free to ask it. We've got a few here to start with, and uh, uh, this is for the whole panel. You know, another reporter, Tom Freeman, wrote a book recently called The World is Flat, or Almost, uh, <laughs> in that some people are flat and some aren't. But it certainly says we live in a, in a world that's growing closer together and um, you've got blogging now, you've got all different kinds of ways of getting information. How has that changed risk communication you know, from your perspective? How we get information in a crisis, trust it, and so on? And that's for any member of the panel. I'll, I'll just uh, begin with just a few brief words. And I, I believe that the for example, among other things, that the availability of information through the internet has radically changed the, uh, the balance of power between experts and non-experts. Uh, that in the past, that it'd be very difficult, for example, for uh, a citizen, let alone a reporter, to challenge an expert because of the difficulty of access, let alone the ability to interpret expert information. Uh, now, it's fairly standard that both individuals as well as those involved in a crisis will first explore the issue through the internet 
access the information that in the past was virtually impossible to access, let alone to understand what it means. And I would argue that that's, this has resulted in a uh, democratization of information that has radically changed the playing field, uh, that experts in the past could use their specialized knowledge as a way by which to deny access for others, and now it's become readily accessible in a way that individuals can challenge experts in more than just simply generic ways, but challenge them on specific topics itself. Ron, any thoughts? Or? I think that's a good point. Uh, the fact that you now, uh, with any crisis, any event, any disaster, have uh, thousands of people going online and blogging and sending out uh, information. Uh, for I can remember even uh, going back to the uh, war in Kosovo, uh, a very difficult place to get information from. Journalists were having a tough time getting in and out and finding out what was going on. And yet, what I was doing here at the University of Illinois was monitoring uh, blogs being sent out by people who were on the ground, people who were living there and were, had access to computers and they were sending information out. So uh, th that's a really important point, that, uh, the, the, the flat world, so-called flat world that we're living in, that uh, information is no longer hierarchical. It's actually uh, on a level playing, playing field. People can get to it very quickly. Now, the only caveat there, of course, is that uh, because there's such a, a plethora of information out there and there's such a, an abundance of it, uh, you have to be sure that what you're seeing, hearing, reading, listening to is, uh, been properly, has been properly vetted and is actually accurate, and there is no guarantee of that. And so the traditional role of the media, uh, the organized media in our society, has been a sort of a vetting operation. In other words, when that information comes down, it's looked at, examined, analyzed, uh, uh, considered, uh, organized, packaged in a compelling way and put out for, uh, for consumers to, to use. Uh, on the internet, that's not being done. Uh, so the information that's coming across is, uh, you know, uh, buyer beware. And, uh, you know, one of the things about uh, the Friedman's book, uh, The World is Flat, is I, I I wonder about, uh, I've, I've mentioned one time to somebody, I wonder what happens to the people who are living in Australia. They're hanging by their feet. <laughs> so anyway, there you go. I've got mixed feelings on the internet because number one is when I was over in Iraq and we had a difficulty in getting out good stories, I actually had my own website going. And I, I, one, it was so that my family could see pictures and things that I had, but I also always included some positive things we did. And at one point, uh, I was kind of, it was kind of hinted strongly to me by Department of Defense to close it down because it wasn't something they authorized. And so I went back to the young man who was running it for me. I said, well, I guess I need to close it down. He's like, no, you had 100,000 hits. Don't you want people to know the good things that are going on too? And I started getting emails from Girl Scout leaders and others who appreciated they found a place that did have good stories. And so in that sense, I thought it was very good because um, well, uh, different media outlets have different perspectives. And when I asked one station, I said, why aren't you covering anything positive? He said, look, we're against this war, and why would I write something that my editor won't put out there? Okay, fair enough. But the other problem is, of course, is the plethora of information. And when we are in a crisis, we have found ourselves overwhelmed sometimes with information that's out there. And that's why I've said I, w I need to dedicate people to gathering facts, because the last thing I need to be doing is chasing my tail, responding to rumors. So as I said, I've got mixed feelings on this. Yeah, it's interesting. We live in a world where we've turned internet services into verbs. We now Google. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that shows how much it's changed. I remember when, Jill, when you were nominated for the deputy chief of staff's position, I Googled you. you know, and you brought up that website and so on. So unfortunately, it never comes off <laughs> yeah. unless you take it off. So you can Google stuff all the way back to whatever, and that's part of that challenge. Uh, second question, I think we probably have time for maybe two. Um, a quick one, why do reporters have a right to interview us? Uh, as citizens and public officials, where does that end? And where do you just say, I'm not interested? 
Well, as, as, certainly as public officials, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think journalists have any specific right to interview anybody. I think what their function in our society is, however, is to be what we call a watchdog on government, and that's what they're supposed to be doing. It's why it's called the fourth estate. It's an uh, unofficial estate of, of, of government, and the objective there is to uh, make sure that uh, uh, information, uh, that information that deserves a public hearing gets a public hearing, and uh, that you then take the concerns of your constituency, your, your reading, viewing public, to public officials and ask questions which will help those people make intelligent decisions about their lives, about people that they elect to office. I and mean, that's one of the major functions. So uh, public officials must be responsive to uh, the media because the media are the surrogates of, of the public, really. We represent them. And uh, uh, I think that's, the, that's always been the traditional role. Now, what's happened with the internet, of course, and with blogging is that you have now people who are setting themselves up and saying, well, I am a journalist too, I've got a, I've got a website, I blog. Uh, but there are, you know, they are people who are pursuing a particular viewpoint, a particular uh, uh, interest, and uh, obviously a public official can't sit down with uh, 3,000 bloggers a week and be interviewed by them. So we'll go back again to the to the model that we all know, and that is the professional news, news organization which does this kind of, of thing. Now, when it comes to individuals, citizens, people who have been involved in a catastrophe or some kind of a uh, horrific event, no, there's no right that we have to talk to those people. Uh, in fact, one of the things I've found that journalists do and can do quite well and I found over my career, when talking to people who are under tremendous stress, these, these high levels of stress that Dr. Cavello was talking about, if you have a conversation with these people, in other words, you're not going and talking to them and just asking questions, question one, two, three, and four, but you're conversing with them and demonstrating true empathy, which I think most reporters will do, because after all, reporters are human beings, and they are wrapped up in these events and they, they are Im impacted by them. What happens when you have uh, conversations with people who have been in these stressful situations is that you find yourself being uh, a kind of a cathartic agent. Uh, people talking to you, it helps them get this pain out of their system up to a point, a certain point. And then it's the responsibility of the journalist to make sure that information you're hearing and what the person is saying is being accurately conveyed. If that's not done, then you will cause more harm than good. So there's no right to speak of, I think, unless you're talking about public officials. Thank you. Uh, let's finish with one last one, and, and uh, I'd like to use your rule of three. Right. And really the question says, the U.S. is a complicated place. A lot of diversity, a lot of different agendas and perspectives and subcultures. Uh, what are three things that citizens and reporters and leaders can do together to improve our ability to help each other in a crisis from your perspectives? Vince, I'll start with you. Since you began with the, the notion of diversity, uh, I would, I'll just start with that as a a principle, and that is to respect that diversity in, in communications, particularly in a crisis. Uh, when we were discussing the Gulf War earlier, uh, it came to mind that one of the few uh, mistakes that General Norman Schwarzkopf made during the Gulf War was using a concept that we often assume is universally understood, but that uh, has very great diverse meaning throughout the world, and that was the concept of luck. Uh, he referred to a, a person who, as the luckiest man alive, who had crossed over a bridge before a, a rocket had struck the bridge. Uh, the concept of luck is a, a cultural concept, uh, a cultural concept that is not accepted throughout the world, and, and as part of the respect for the multicultural, diverse world in which we live, there are many people in the world who believe that things don't happen because of luck. They happen because of fate because of the will of Allah. 
Um, same thing with nonverbal communication. Uh, we take for granted that how we communicate in the United States is a universal phenomenon. Well, um, unfortunately, the, the groundbreaking, for example, book by Desmond Morris, The Dictionary of Human Gestures, indicates quite differently that what we take for granted is culturally uh, universal is in fact very culturally diverse. And so I'll just offer up that as just one of the additions to my presentation earlier. I didn't really have time to deal with the, the difficulties, the complexity, let alone the response to a cult, highly diverse world. Yeah, in fact, in one of your, uh, part of your lectures, you talked about Desmond Morris and said, almost anything you say, do, or, or gesture you have means, has different meanings depending on where you are. In some cases, polar opposites. Exactly. Joost? Yeah, following up on uh, Dr. Covello's uh, answer, I think what is very important in, in risk communication is that we truly try to understand the underlying decision-making process of our stakeholders. And clearly the decision-making process uh, may be different for different people, for different cultures. And hence, uh, the way we respond uh, could trigger a behavior that we uh, basically were not intending to trigger. So trying to get at that underlying decision-making process is, is, is crucial. And, but at the same time, it's, it's very difficult because underlying decision-making process, it's latent. It's not, you know, you cannot observe it uh, directly. Uh, but we are fortunate, as Dr. Govella said, we are making uh, good progress in, in science and in psychometrics. So nowadays we are able to model uh, this underlying decision-making process. And I think if we can basically uh, combine that with risk communication, we will be uh, more and more effective in the, in the near future. You know, there's a great study in leadership on Robert E. Lee as the commander of the uh, Confederate forces. And what it basically says is, he wasn't beating the Union, he was dealing with each and every general he had to deal with. And as the new general came on, he restudied how that general might act or react, and then said, well, how do I deal with that? And so it was a real study in his opponent as opposed to a study in the military, per se. I, to me, it was very insightful on how, how he thought about what he did. Um, Ron? Well, I think I, I alluded to this a little bit in my, in my uh, uh, introductory remarks, and that is I, I think that uh, the idea, the concept that you were mentioning here, uh, of, of some kind of a working arrangement, partnership, what, whatever you want to call it, between the authorities, people who are trying to manage a crisis, and the media, people who are trying to convey the depth and breadth of a crisis and also trying to make sense out of it, uh, is a very important partnership, and, and I think it should be viewed that way. It should not be viewed as an adversarial relationship. Now, I know that people do think that way. I mean, I know journalists and government officials think of themselves sometimes as adversaries because, uh, but, you, know, because you have a relationship which uh, maybe somebody has, uh, you've written a story about somebody or some uh, agency or whatever which is not flattering, which may have been uh, detrimental to somebody's career. Uh, factual, hopefully, and uh, therefore you have this sense of betrayal, a sense of suspicion and whatever. I think a critical thing today, in today's world, when we talk about the things that are happening around the world, whether you call it a war on terror or whatever you want to call it, uh, is that organizations, cities, municipalities, states, whatever, and need to have a good, solid understanding of, of how the media operate. And I think what we heard Dr. Cavello talking about earlier about the fact that the, or actually, I'm sorry, um, what Dick was saying earlier, that the fact that uh, Dr. Cavello had worked with uh, Rudy Giuliani seven years before 9-11 on the messages that would be put out in case something like this happened. To me, that's a very salient, very relevant point, because that's what you need to be thinking about as, uh, if you're in the media today and if you're in government, thinking about how you work with one another to effectively uh, uh, put out an accurate portrayal, an accurate message that will be beneficial and helpful to the public. Joe? Um, being last, I had the most time to think. So I have three A's. <laughs> we can copyright this as I say it. <laughs> And then tomorrow we got to execute it, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, as the, as the government official dealing with the media, 
and using the media to get information out to the public. First of all, um, on the three A's, number one, be available. I think one of the problems I had over in Abu Ghraib is I had these general officers who were not available to the media. And therefore, they could not tell their side of the story of things that were happening, so there always was some suspicious suspicions out there. So, um, and that's one thing I, I, I do work my heart, hardest at being available to the media when we have had different incidences. We've had a lot of weather crises this year, and I've been available. The second thing is be approachable. And I think what that really means is a sense of body language and I want to tell my story. I want hopefully at least one aspect, a soundbite or something picked up. So I have got to be approachable and willing to take the questions and you know, be prepared to speak. And then finally, attitude. And you know, I could be sitting like this and you know I don't want to speak to someone. I truly believe in freedom of the press. I, 30 years in the military, being overseas in dictatorships where I've seen the press is just a propaganda tool. I believe that the press, the, one of the great things about America is the press is one of our watch guards. And therefore, I need to approach the press honestly, getting out and hopefully getting my message out. And so by having those three things, um, approachable, available, and with the right attitude, then I can hopefully get my message out to the people on what is happening and what needs to be done to keep people alive. Thank you. Well, I want to thank each of our panelists for A, being here tonight, but B, for just such an extraordinary evening. I've been to a lot of things we do around here, but I, I really learned a lot, and I hope you did too. Thank you very much. <laughs>